Hello, and welcome to Rome 2, Episode 5, Laying the Foundation. We're back! Missed the day. It snowed Monday, so I thought I was gonna get stuck working, but then it didn't snow a lot, so kind of got caught in limbo, but we're back here Wednesday, December 13th, and we're gonna get at it. So, we are still on turn two, spring of 278 BCE. If you recall last time, we took the city of Aretium, and we decided we wanted to loot the city. So we have 13,122 denarii to spend, and that's we are going to spend. First, we're going to upgrade the city of Rome. So here it is, Roma, the ancient capital the eternal city right now it has minus two food plus two growth per turn plus two squalor in the region 507 wealth from subsistence it has a campus martius which acts as a barracks it has the port of ostia which will also be our spotlight plus 100 wealth from trade plus five percent wealth from all sources and a plus 0.1 percent all population classes so we're going to upgrade that it's going to take six turns and 4,836 denarii, but we are going to gain, or we're gain. First, we're gonna lose three food. So we lose three food. Our growth per turn doesn't change. Our squalor, we gain one. We go from 507 to 844 subsistence. Ostia gains 100 wealth from trade. We gain from 5% to 10% wealth from all sources. And then we have a plus 0.5% first, second, and third class citizens. It also comes with the training of a whole bunch of uh, units. Most of those units are kind of just the local recruitable units, so we don't care too much about them. But yeah, we are going to upgrade Rome, and that's going to take about a third of our money. As the uh, name of the episode suggested, laying the foundation... Buildings are incredibly important, even though that costs like 4,800 denarii, and we're only gaining like maybe 500 from that. The idea here isn't that you're going to be losing a ton of money, it's for every few hundred denarii that you gain per turn, that's maybe one or two more units per turn that you can afford to upkeep. And that's how I justify my expenditure. The more money that you spend to upgrade these buildings, the more they'll pay off and the more revenue you generate per turn, leaving that per turn income high. That's why when possible, I like to loot a city because it gives you a really big cash injection. Now, remember, it does have the downside of we have a negative 52 public order hit next turn and we're gonna get there, but you know, what are you gonna do? So. A little bit about Rome. Remember, each building has a description. So here's the description about Roma, the eternal city. Even in the ancient world, cities grew up in places where people had already been living for a long time because the sites were defensible, controlled river crossings, had natural resources nearby, or were safe from floods and other natural disasters. Cities, despite their rulers' best intentions, were rarely planned. There might be sections where public buildings stood by broad, open streets and temples were laid out in magnificent splendor, and patrician dwellings had rich opulence behind bland frontages. But equally likely, if you walked a few paces in wrong directions, you would be guaranteed to find a maze of twisty back streets, cheek by jowl houses, and rundown slums, alehouses, whorehouses, and slaughterhouses, all jostling for what little space there was within the walls. The city was the world in miniature, with all the wonder and squalor that implied. Romans and Greeks equally could take civic pride in their urbanity and its sophistication, and at the same moment be a little disgusted by the dirt and tawdriness of the back street only yards away. So, that description didn't have to do with Rome per se, but it did a very good job describing Rome. So, eventually we're going to cover this, but after the initial sack of Rome by Brennus, the city wasn't completely razed to the ground, but it was pretty well and good destroyed, and a good portion of the population was misplaced. 
So, when deciding, do we rebuild Rome here? Do we move Rome to a different location? Do we just abandon Rome? What do we do? It was decided that it's Rome. It's the city of Rome. You can't just abandon it, that they would rebuild it. But, if you can just imagine for a minute that for three days and three nights, a bunch of barbarians are running through your city, taking away anything that wasn't nailed down, destroying buildings, killing people, and when they finally left, you came out to disaster. No food, no furniture, your sculptures are all gone, anything that could be taken was taken. You don't really plan a city. You're not going to sit there, well, oh, well, the barbarians, yep, they looted everything, so let's get together, everyone, you know, everyone that survived, we're just going to leave the dead in the streets, and we're going to not worry about our houses, who cares that it might be raining, we're just going to go plan a nice grid city. No, that doesn't happen. So, they kind of just, the city propped up, it just, oh, we have a building standing over here, all right, let's make a street next to it, we have a standing building, oh, we have some ruins here, let's try to cobble this together. So you get those twisting back streets like they described. Sure, at some points you might, you know, have a rich person buy out a section and level it and make it look nice, but when Rome was rebuilt, it was nothing like the castrums, those are the forts, or the military forts that were built that were laid out in that grid style, or when Rome would go on to found further cities and they had that nice, beautiful grid style, that, that was not Rome. Rome was a disaster. One wrong turn and you could end up, you know, getting a knife in your back and your coin pouch stolen but yeah that's the city of rome the next building we're going to move on to is the two roman hamlets in the province of latium so we're going to go over to ariminum here and we're going to look up this roman hamlet so roman hamlet minor settlement fish communities thrive and grow on common ground and interests so, we're going to go and see what's provided. Alright, so we're going to go from a Roman hamlet to a Roman village. In the process, we are going to go from 5 fish to 15 fish. So we're going to gain 10 fish resources. We're going to go from 1 food to 3 food. So we're going to gain 2 food. Plus 1 to plus 2 growth per turn. So we're going to gain 1 growth per turn plus one squalor to plus two squalor, so we're going to gain a squalor, 86 wealth from maritime commerce to 118 wealth from maritime commerce. We're going to just round that to about 20 denarii generated from maritime commerce, plus one fleet recruitment capacity, plus seven supplies, and we're going to go from plus 0.1% first, second, and third class citizens to 0.5% first, second, and third class citizens. And then the Roman village is called Beyond the Grandor, the Roman world is one of villages, not great cities. So we're going to upgrade from that village, or from that hamlet, to a village. So you might be thinking, well, what's the description? Here it is. Wherever the Romans went, they not only conquered, but also settled and built communities. They used stone and brick to construct colonies that were meant to last. Colonial towns developed from the small hamlets and villages some of which already existed, becoming centers of regional administration and commerce. The planned provincial towns, or civitates, were built in a square grid pattern with stone peripheral walls for protection. The smaller bici were less formal, often growing up outside Roman army camps and oversupply soldiers with the comforts and pleasures of home. So look at that. I, like, predicted the future. So you saw there, when Rome would march into an area, if it already had like a town near a river, near a major crossing, near some important natural resource, Rome would just occupy that town and then build into it. You know, they would Romanize it. Uh, that happened a lot in Gaul. They were famous for Romanizing a lot of the Gallic towns. Same thing I'd say in North Africa and Spain. In the east, it got a little muddled. Because the East, you know, Greece, Syria, Egypt, they had been around longer than Rome, much longer. So they kind of had their own stone buildings and their own infrastructure. They didn't really Romanize it very well. If anything, they kind of changed the way Rome functioned in those areas. But 
Spain and Gaul was mostly barbarian tribes. They didn't really have huge stone architecture. Now, they had some. Don't let people mislead you that they were just a bunch of, you know, nerf herders leaving their mud huts. No, they, they, they had some stone buildings, but nothing like the art and architecture of uh, the Greco-Roman period, you know, where the Romans stole it from the Greeks. All right, so that is Roman Village of Fish. We have 5,868 denarii. I didn't say how much it cost. All right, so that Roman Village of Fish was only 2,418 denarii. It wasn't that expensive. However, this Roman Hamlet of Salt, pricey. It's going to cost us 4,278 denarii, which will just about strap us. But you know what? That's okay. So we're going to go from 5 salt to 15 salt. So we're going to gain 10 salt. We're going to go from 0 food to minus 2 food. So we're going to lose 2 food by building this building. We're going to go from plus 2 growth to plus 3 growth per turn. So we're going to gain 1 growth per turn. We're going to go from 0 public order bonus to a 2 public order bonus. So we're gaining 2 public order. We're going to go from plus 1 squalor to plus 2 squalor. So we're gaining a squalor. 168 wealth from maritime commerce to 254 wealth from maritime commerce. I'm going to do my quick and easy math again. So that's going to be about 80 wealth generated. And then plus 10% wealth from maritime commerce to plus 15% wealth from maritime commerce with a plus 0.1% first, second, and third class citizens to a plus 0.5% first, second, and third class citizens. So all of these Hamlets or villages have the same generic description, so we're not going to read those anymore. These two hamlets upgrading to villages will also take six turns. So in six turns, we will get a nice, healthy bump in income. Just like when we finish those fishing boats and salt mines in four turns, they will get a nice, healthy bump in income. And hopefully you kind of put it together, but all these bonuses... You know, Rome has a 10% wealth from all sources bonus. You're going to get um, a plus 15% wealth from maritime commerce bonus in the Roman village of Salt, located in Asculum. We're building a commercial province. That's what it is. Latium is going to be commerce. At the moment, if you remember, we are going with bread and games because I want to get them back out of the red for public order as quickly as possible. But... Perhaps in six turns, when these buildings finish, we swap it back over to commercial stimulation. We also want to go up here to Legio 2. I neglected to do it, but this Hastata unit, we're not going to use anymore. We don't need it, so instead of paying the 130 denarii per turn, we're just going to disband it. Save ourselves a little bit of money. And that's all that I wanted to do for this turn. So... Without further ado, we are going to end the turn and see what happens. At the moment, we have 1,590 denarii in the treasury. We're making 2,234 next turn. We have 10 food, and it is spring of 278 BCE. We do still have the taxes off in Magna Gratia, so I think I'm going to want to turn those on next turn. We're ending the turn now real quick. But I haven't quite decided what I want to do. So once again, a touch upon the name of the episode, Laying the Foundation. This is kind of what I call the interim period, the calm before the storm, if you will, because once Rome goes to war again, Rome does not stop going to war. I forget the name of it, but there was a temple built in Rome she'll look this up and I believe it is when the doors are closed Rome is at war when the doors are open Rome is at peace and for almost the entirety of Rome the doors are closed I could have that backwards but I don't think I do anyways it's something worth looking up it's a temple in Rome and the significance of the doors being open or closed is important anyways our turn went by just fine nothing happened so welcome to turn three summer of 278 bce we got a little pop-up here 
It says, Magna Gratia secured. Now that Rome is no longer at war in southern Italy, the uneasy peace between Carthage and Rome has become frayed. Should Rome seek to assert her influence into Sicily, Carthage will take this as a sign of war. So this is the game, like I said, kind of forcing you into a conflict with Carthage. Now it thinks that I secured southern Italy, right? That I attacked a Pyros and kicked Pyrrhus out. But I didn't, I just made peace. So kind of tricked the game. Now what's gonna happen is somewhere in either the coding or whatever, Carthage is gonna start to get angry at me because they think I'm pushing into Syracuse right, Sicily, which I'm not doing at all. I'm just laying the foundation of my empire, right? I'm just building buildings and trying to get a massive income per turn so that I can form my armies. We'll see how it all shakes out, but at some point, Carthage will come after me because that's what they do. All right, our treasury is up to 4,400 denarii. Our gain is 2,642 per turn. We did lose two food. We are at eight food. And that's it. Let's go through our event messages. We looked at Magna Gratia secured. Edict issued. Latium. Breton Games. Word has been received. The governor of this province will carry out your edict until you command otherwise. Unhappy populace. Latium. The people of this province are unhappy. If uprisings are to be avoided, public order should be improved. So, an unhappy populace has a minus 4 growth per turn modifier and minus 8% tax rate. And that's because we are between minus 50 and minus 74 public order per turn. Painful for sure. Household expands. Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina got a professional heckler. One's enemies must be put in their place all the time. Plus 1 gravitas per turn, plus 1 cunning. Don't you like a professional heckler? Someone that follows you around and just heckles your opponents. And then war declor declared. The Venetii and the Insubres. Actions replace words. Diplomacy has failed and these two factions are at war to settle their differences. Wow. Right, so we're going to review that first. You don't see that happen very often. So Massalia is still over there just hanging out. Not doing much. No diplomatic moves, just just hanging. So here we have the Ligurians, the Venetii, and the Insubres. The Ligurians are at war with the Insubres. And the Venetii are at war with the Insubres. Then the Insubres by themselves at war with the Venetii and the Ligurians. This is quite potentially the best case scenario. Because what this means is that the Ligurians of Genoa and the Venetii of Patavium, they are the ones that both control access to Rome right now. They are the ones that have roads directly into my territory. And the Insubres do not, but they're at war with the Insubres. So if I can support Patavium and Genoa, right, the oh, Venetians nice. and Liguria, I could potentially make some friends. So we're going to try to inch close enough here with our spy, Ulpius Severa, to come in contact with a shadow the Insubres. On the road again. That should have got us close enough that we can initiate diplomacy with them. We can. They do not like us. Minus 85. So they approve of expansionism Roma. Plus five, but they condemn our treaties with Venetia and our treaties with Liguria. And the Insubres, they are a Celtic people, and they are aggressive and reliable. Also, it's worthy to note that between Genoa, Medhalan, and Patavium, that is a province. That will be the province of Cisalpania. So these three cities do make a province, and that Medhalan is the only walled city there. Petavium and Genoa do not have walls, but we are not going to really care too much about this for now. I don't really want to expand northward, because if you look here, that leaves multiple avenues. Right now, I'm only defending two avenues into Rome, and if I'm friends with 
the Ligurians and the Venetii. They'll do the defending for me. So what this means is perhaps in a few turns, what I'll do is declare war on the Insubres, and that'll make the Ligurians and the Venetii even happier with me. Now, just like your governors, you can deploy a spy in an area. So I'm going to have Opia Sevra establish an intelligence network. It recruits spies, informants, and collaborators to hinder enemy armies and support the movement of your armies in the region. Now, she's going to deploy, which means it's the end of her turn, that's fine. But when she moves next turn, she won't be able to redeploy immediately. So if you move out of a deployment stance, it takes a turn or so to bounce back. Just how the game is. Our governors are administrating, so we're just going to leave them alone and let them keep doing their thing. Let's check our public order. So Rome, the province of Latium, is at minus 55 with minus 7 next turn, which is bad. So what's hurting here is that provincial instability. It's minus 11 with minus 1 per turn. We also have cultural differences as minus nine, so that's not terrible. It's mostly just that provincial instability is killing me. We are still 55.3% Latin, and we are actually losing a little bit of Latin influence. Down in Magna Gratia, we are at minus 13 with minus two movement. And we have gone to 6.6% .6 Latin with a 3.5% move next turn. I really want to retax the province for money and for food, but I don't know if I should. So Legio 1 is in a patrol stance here. We are still at the negatives. So we're going to move Legio 1 away from the border here. I was trying to gain line of sight on Terrace, but I could not. And then we'll orders. put it close to Beneventum, put it back in a patrol stance. So here I can do a couple things. I can recruit two Principes in the two legions I have in the city, have them exit the city and enter a patrol stance. That will certainly help, but then these generals will lose experience. I think... I think that's what we're going to have to do. Come so we're going to move Lucius Julius Libo back towards Rome. That's your command. And we're going to move... What's his name? Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio Asina. We're going to actually move him down to Beneventum. Put him in the city. Set up the watch. That's your command. We're going to have Advance. the army that Libo is currently leading and transfer it to... Legio 4, led by Lucius Lucius Papyrus Cursor, and we're going to toss Lucius Julius Libo in the town, so he can gain some experience. And then we're just going to put Legio 4 in a patrol stance. It'll be outside of Rome, so yeah, we are down to minus 55 with a minus 3 move next turn. I think what's getting us here in Magna Graecia is that, I mean, there's a couple things, but cultural differences still hurt. Minus 13 is definitely pain. really want to turn the money back on, but... Hmm. We're not going to turn the money on just yet. But, we do have 4,400 denarii, and we do have a construction site available, so we are going to build something in Aretium. Now, Retium is going to be lined up a little bit different. It does not have a port in the construction site area. So both Ariminum and Ascalum came with a port. So their first construction slot is the Roman hamlet that's becoming a village. Their second construction slot is the port. And their third construction slot is the resource. 
we are going to build a Agar Publicus in a second construction slot. It will take two turns to build, and it will cost us 2,232 denarii. So what is an Agar Publicus? Open ground is an opportunity for the wise. Even in the ancient world, cities grew up in places... Well, we already read this. Yeah, so the Agar Publicus has the same exact description as the cities. But basically, Agar Publicus just means public land. It was land that was publicly owned. And the Agar Publicus is going to give us plus two public order per turn, plus one growth per turn, and plus 0.1% second class citizens. That's not very good for anything, but it can turn into five buildings. The Trader, the Medicus, the Auditorium, the Municipium, and the Stationus Vigilum. Now, the Trader is basically going to be your commercial building, the Medicus is your health building, the Auditorium is going to be your entertainment slash, I guess, culture building, the Municipium is basically making it a Roman town, and the Stations Vigilum is basically making it a Roman frontier town. Now, I never really got the point of a Stationus Vigilum in an internal city. You don't need it. I also don't really have this, you know, province of Latium focusing on entertainment, so I don't need the stadium, or the auditorium, or the theater. That's that building chain. Uh, the Medicus and the Valetudinorium are good, but I don't need them quite yet. So what we're going to go with here, because remember, Latium is going to be a commercial province, is we're eventually going to go to the trader. Commerce is the heart of any empire. Minus four public order per turn from unrest, plus two growth per turn, 60 wealth from local commerce, plus three banditry in the local province, plus four percent tariff income from trade agreements, plus 10 percent wealth from all sources, plus 0.3 percent second class citizens, and plus 0.2 percent foreigner population. So it's going to be a few turns before we get there. But that 10% wealth from all sources is what we're going for in the trader. And eventually that becomes plus 20% wealth from all commerce when it goes into the large market. So there is your Agar Publicus. Now we are down to 2,168 denarii per turn, which is not very good. And I think I am going to pull the trigger on... Retaxing Magna Gratia. We're just not making enough money. So yeah, we're going to turn the taxes back on. And then I'm going to recruit two Principes into the uh, Legio Three, led by Gnaeus Cornelius Scipio. And then we're going to eventually put him in the countryside and have him also enter a patrol stance. Take a quick look at the rest of our diplomatic map, see if anything changed. We didn't get any notifications, so I don't think it did. Nope, everything else is still pretty calm. Apyros and the Insubres are the only ones that hate us. Like I said, I think I'm gonna march Legio 4 now, north. And then just declare war on the Insubres. It looks like the Ligurians and the Venetians are mustering. Oh, and the Insubres are too. They're all getting ready for battle. Alright, so what's what's our next move? Well, you saw the north looks relatively secure, so we're going to leave that alone. Terrace, eventually, but it's going to be firm up the economy and build up the military. That's what we need to do, and we'll spend probably the next five years just doing that, but I'd like to get to our spotlight. Ostia, the famous port of Rome. You can't see, but for those of you that can, Ostia would have been located here, right on the mouth of the Tiber, on the southern edge. So without further ado, let's find out about Ostia. So Ostia Antica also known as Ancient Ostia. It was an ancient Roman city and the all-important port of Rome. 
all the grain that would come in from Sicily and northern Africa and eventually the Nile to feed that giant population of Rome came into the port of Ostia, which was very important. It was located at the mouth of the Tiber. It lies about 15 miles southwest of Rome. The site is now about two miles inland, though, due to silting and other worldly events. So basically, the river silted in, storms happened, other stuff, and the ancient port of Ostia got stuck inland. The name Ostia comes from the plural of the word ostium, which comes from the Latin os, or mouth. Makes sense, right? Mouth of the river, mouth of Rome. That's where I'm going with it. So it's said that Ancus Marcius, the fourth king of Rome, destroyed the nearby Latin city-state of Ficana, which was only 11 miles away from Rome. He then proceeded to march on their six more miles west to the coast where he founded Ostia. This might have been Rome's first colonia, which is a settlement of Roman origins. So after destroying this city-state, which was only 11 miles from Rome, picture how close 11 miles actually is, he thought, well, this is a little bit too far inland, right? Because they did have a harbor, but it was six miles off the coast. So he said, let's found Ostia on the coast. So there's archaeological evidence that Ostia was founded around the 7th century BCE, with further evidence showing up that it was definitely there in the 4th and 3rd century. There's also evidence that in 267 BCE, during the First Punic War, it was developed as a naval base, not just a trading port. In 87 BCE, during the Civil Wars, Marius attacked the city in order to cut off the supplies to Rome. He captured it and looted it. A few decades later, in 68 BCE, the city was attacked by pirates. It was looted, set afire, and the consular fleet that was stationed there was destroyed. Two prominent senators were even kidnapped. This led to Pompey the Great passing the law the Lex Gebenina and raising an army. He then put that army on ships, and within a year, the pirates were dealt with. Marcus Tullius Cicero rebuilt the city and added additional defenses. Cicero being the guy that probably realized Ostia was really important to keeping Rome fed and thereby happy, so he did what he could. Now, things change a little bit, little bit here. Under imperial rule, in the first century CE, Tiberius ordered the town's first forum built. So instead of just being the port of Rome, it started to become a town in its own right. But, as the saying goes, the winds change and fortune favors the bold. Due to the small size at the harbor at Ostia, a new harbor at Portus was built by Claudius on the northern mouth of the Tiber. So if you recall, Ostia was on the southern end of the Tiber. Portus would be on the northern end of the Tiber. This port was not well protected by storms, though, and so Trajan built a hexagonal harbor that was finished in 113 CE, and this became the primary port of Rome. A short distance away was also the harbor of Civitavecchia, developed by Trajan. Both of these ports took business away from Ostia, and thus began its decline. Or, so people thought. Yes, the city probably, you know, contracted a little bit, but the evidence doesn't show a complete decline. Despite Portus and Civitavecchia taking away a lot of the trade and the commerce, Ostia did have a theater, baths, taverns, inns, and even a firefighting force. The cult of Mithras was popular, and one of the earliest known synagogues was discovered there. Now, obviously earliest known in the western portion of the Roman Empire. Judaism was alive and well over in Syria and the Middle East, and Judea, but not quite in the western reaches. Now, after Constantine made Portus a municipality, it was thought that Ostia would have a rapid decline. But, that was not the case. There is a whole flurry of activity in the 4th and 5th centuries, with repairs to the Neptune Baths in the 370s. The city even grew outside of its southern walls. So despite Portus becoming the primary port of Rome, Ostia was still functioning. The evidence continues to indicate that Ostia was important because roads continued to be built, 
buildings were maintained, and other buildings that fell out of disrepair were demolished, and new buildings were built there. Kind of looked like it actually became a summer home for rich people. A lot of villas propped up, and they kind of just sat there. However, all good things must come to an end. When the Western Roman Empire fell in 476 BCE, so did the port of Ostia slowly decline. Ostia's health was directly tied to that of the city of Rome. In 400 CE, Rome had a population of about 800,000, but by the time it hit 500 CE, it was less than 200,000. And worse than Portus taking its share of commerce was Rome losing a population of 600,000 people. That's 600,000 less supplies that were coming in from the sea to supply Rome through Ostia. Now this isn't in Roman times anymore, but we're going to jump a little bit forward. In 849 CE, there was a major naval battle there between the Christian League and a Muslim fleet. So during this time period, uh, the Muslim forces were pushing up through Spain, and they were also in Sicily trying to push, push up through Italy. And the Christian kingdoms there, so the Papal States, Naples, etc., all those small city-state kingdoms came together in the Battle of Ostia. The Muslim fleet was badly beaten, there was a storm that approached, and the Christian fleet returned to their harbors, and the Muslim fleet kind of got blown all over the place, and then was picked off one by one. At this point in history, though, the shifting nature of the Tiber had landlocked the port, so ancient Ostia was renamed Regoropoli, and was primarily used as a shelter for the nearby salt miners. Today, you can still visit ancient Ostia because it is a major archaeological site. And that's about it. That's ancient Ostia for you. With that said, we are down to 208 denarii per turn. It is hopefully going to make 2,976 denarii next turn. We did turn the taxes back on at Magna Gratia. And we're going to head into our next turn and see what happens. no diplomatic incidents and we can ride right into turn four without any serious issues cropping up remember we don't really want to get dragged into any wars we can help it until we're making about eight to ten thousand denarii per turn and we have more than just one tiny army look at that research complete land management Good land does not look after itself. It needs tending by many hands. You have completed a technological advancement, giving you advantage over your rivals. Quartermaster report. Legio 3 has recruited two legionaries. Oh, I got so excited I forgot to tell you. Welcome to turn 4. Fall of 278 BCE. So we're going to move Legio 3 outside of Beneventum. Not too far, leave them close, and put them in a patrol stance. So now we have Legio 1 and Legio 3 patrolling outside of Beneventum. So Beneventum, right, the province of Magna Gratia, is currently at minus 2, with minus 7, la minus seven movement next turn, and it still has a minus 13 cultural differences hit. We are now 9.8% Latin with a 3% move next turn. But the province is generating 509 denarii per turn. Latium is at minus 58 with a movement of minus four next turn, and their province is generating 3,615 income. We do have some unseasonal conditions though. We have an early autumn in Magna Gratia. So, once again, let's apply some real life logic. If autumn comes early, is that a good or bad thing? You guessed it, it's a bad thing. And early autumn brings a poor harvest and hungry people. Minus two public order per turn, minus two percent morale for all units in the local armies, and only a plus 10% wealth from agri agriculture. Basically, think of it this way. You're a farmer, and your crops are growing, 
and this season you wanted a double crop. That means you plant one set of crops, you harvest it, then you plant another. So perhaps you had an early spring, and you got that early plant in, and you harvested it early. Now you needed to go to, I don't know, let's call it October, before you had your first frost. But you had a frost in September, and that frost killed off your harvest. Not good. Not only did you lose all that money, you know, the seeds, the time, and the effort, but you're not going to get to sell that crop at market. So that is why an early autumn is bad. You always wanted, if you could, an early spring and a late autumn. In Latium, we also have an early autumn. So I'm not going to read it because it's going to be the same thing, but it is very negative. Two early autumns are definitely hurting the public order and the wealth of the republic. Now, our governors are still doing their thing and governoring. Look at them go. Opia Severa was deployed, but now she isn't, so we're going to move her. Not along the coast. We're going to move her towards the interior of Illyria here. See if we can't contact a few native peoples. Get some intelligence on who's here. So we just ran into... Two factions. We encountered the Nori, who are currently in Norea. And we encountered the Iapodes. And I don't have vision on their city yet, so I don't know what city they are in. Treadings. Oh, and another faction encountered. So we're leaving Genua of the Ligurians, Patavium of the Venetians, and Medhelan of the Insubres behind, and exploring the interior of Illyricum. We also came into contact with the Aravishi, which is an even further inland tribe. I wouldn't even call them Illyrian at this point. I don't even think they're Illyrian. Well, look at Norea has a, a pop-up. Yeah, even Norea is an Illyrian. They are Celtic. So, Norea. Norea forms the capital of the Celtic kingdom of Noricum, whose inhabitants were originally Illyrian, but have been subsumed over time by the Celto-Ligurian tribes. The Celts of Noricum are a warlike people famous for the quality of steel they produce mined from the rich iron deposits in their mountainous territory. From this southern outpost, the Celtic tribes of the region have launched attacks on Italy and nearby regions. So I think Norea, which is part of the province of Raetia et Noricum, is going to become important. It is the only walled city, so you have the other cities of Octoderon, Alcimonesis, and Korea which I think make the four cities that are kind of in the Alps. I don't know, I don't have vision. Yeah, I just kind of clicked on the names. They're going to be the four cities that are in the Alps, and this is going to be the easternmost city. So they are no longer Illyrian. I thought they might be, but they were subsumed by the Celtic culture over time. What else do we want to do? We have 3,000 denarii. Oh yeah, so that's, we used all of our spies movement. She can't move anymore, she can't be deployed. And we have 3,224 denarii to spend. We're going to spend that on... We're going to spend it on nothing right now. You know, let's take a risk here. We're actually going to develop this land. So Aretium... Ascalum and Ariminum all have undeveloped land that can be developed. And if you recall, Aretium has the wine resource. So we're going to expand the city and see if we can't build a Vinter. We can. Alright. Let's see. Vinter. It's going to cost us 2,511 denarii. Vinter. Even a poor wine can be improved with a little art. Wine has been a big part of Western civilizations for thousands of years. The growing and fermenting of grapes began as early as 7000 BCE in what is now the Caucasus. However, much of modern wine culture derives from the practices of the ancient Greeks. To the ancient peoples, wine was not so much a pastime as a religion. The goddess Gestiana in Egypt, Bacchus in Rome, and Dionysus in Greece all looked over the produce of the fermented grape. Whenever the Romans conquered, they also traded, settled, and drank, which accounts for the great spread of viticulture through the empire years and the establishment of major wine regions and grape varieties we know today. However, the ancients would have thought us barbaric for drinking wine undiluted. A civilized culture always mixed at least one part wine with two parts water. 
There you go. You learned a little bit about wine today in the Romans. The Romans loved their wine. Everywhere they went, they had to have their wine. They had to have, the, apparently, their garum and their wheat. We're hitting our time limit, so we handled our event messages. We built another building. We're going to have to deal with the tech next time, but I think that's about it. Thanks for tuning in, and I'll see you next time. Have a good one.